have agreed this evening to talk about Warner Estate Properties, which are extremely well known now, an estate agent phenomenon of the last few decades. I don't myself have any um, extreme expertise in the subject, so I cannot hold myself out as the expert in Warner Estate or anything approaching it, but I'm hoping that I'll be able to remind most of you um, of what you like about the Warner Estate, um, perhaps give one or two um, interesting sidelights to it. So I'm going to start off um, with saying that um, Warner Estates is about the expansion of London. London uh, grew from a small um, probably village out and out over the centuries. And by the 19th century, its expansion is becoming pretty rapid, particularly the second half of the 19th century. And this was driven not by, not by a London plan um, of a government of Queen Victoria, but by market forces, by free enterprise. Um, there was, um, certainly by the time all the state was going, um, some government regulation implemented at local authority level, uh, but it was still basically up to entrepreneurs, um, small, medium and large, to get the process uh, operating. Um, so the typical process uh, as London and some of it expanded to our um, perimeter of London was for families who owned uh, country land to sell chunks of it to the highest bidder. And for that person to divide their purchase up into plots large enough for a house, um, probably with a bit of garden, um, and the houses were usually be arranged um, in the later 19th century in long terraces, but they wouldn't normally be built as one long terrace, that they were, the terrace would be um, built in little chunks of half a dozen or so houses, um, each by a different little builder, um, the builder having rental capital, not, not being big operations. So it was, um, I suppose, a bit like um, something to set of, of Uber, or something nowadays where um, uh, greater forces um, allow the implementation of the economic result by um, small businesses. Um, uh, Warner Estate decide under Courtney Warner to operate an entirely different business model. And their model was to build houses um, consistent so that Warner would, would um, do their own building and they would not um, sell off uh, the houses once they were built uh, or would not allow the um, builders to sell off the houses once they were built. Um, but Warners would, would keep hold of it and do the rent renting out as a big rental enterprise. Warner would then have to maintain all those properties, which they could do in a consistent way. This is my only slide in my collection uh, related to St. Peter's Church, but this is a memorial um, in St. Peter's uh, in memory of Sir Tom Thomas Courtney Thaden Warner Baronet. Um, and uh, it includes him as Lord Lieutenant of Suffolk, Colonel of the Oxfordshire and Buckinghamshire Light Infantry, Charter Mayor of Walthamstow, which is 1820 something, uh, a Member of Parliament 1892 to 1923, and as Francis said, patron of this living. Um, so Courtney Warner um, is the son of Edward Warner that Francis mentioned, and uh, Courtney Warner was born in Grosvenor Place, that's a road running beside Buckingham Palace Gardens. He was educated at Eton College and Oxford University. So he was really kind of born with a silver spoon in his mouth. You wouldn't think that he had a great need to make more money. You'd think the family had more money, but um, he does do that. Uh, his father, Edward, uh, had had ideas of property development locally in Walthamstow. Uh, he'd backed an 1852 scheme to build a railway through Walthamstow to Woodford 
New Road, where St Peter's is. Uh, that development, had it happened, which it didn't, would have opened up the southern part of Epping Forest for house building. Thomas Courtney Thaden Warner, um, well, I'm going to call Courtney Warner because that seems to be the way he's normally referred to, um, inherited from his father Edward in 18, uh, or rather his father died when he was 18, but he only inherited properly when he became uh, the age of majority, 21. And he started, uh, Courtney Warner started his own property development in 1880. And in 1883, he inherited some money from his uncle and that provided some extra capital because the Warner system, as he would implement it, required capital, which um, the alternative entirely free market system didn't require. Courtney Warner tries to get into the House of Commons in 1885. Um, he becomes um, the very first opportunity you could become a member of Essex County Council, 1889. Courtney Warner was elected a member representing Walthamstow High Street Ward. Courtney Warner was uh, in the Liberal Party. That was, that was his, his team, as it were, uh, right from the beginning. Um, but um, he didn't fancy the Liberal Party's chances of getting a, a member of Parliament for the constituency that included Walthamstow. So initially, Courtney Warner um, tried for seats and he was elected for the Member of Parliament for North Somerset in 1892. North Somerset was where the Warner family had land um, as well as Walthamstow and he was elected MP for Litchfield from 1896 to 1923. Um, this is an image of the National Portrait Gallery. Um, I think very much as Courtney Warner would like to be seen. Um, he's not in the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography, but as you can see from um, the uh, plaque in St. Peter's, um, from the start of the photo. Um, Courtney Warner rather played the grand figure in life. Um, as I was reading this up, I was wondering if he hadn't had ambitions once to become a member of the peerage. He did manage to get a baronetcy uh, um, and inherited um, knighthood, a knighthood which would pass to his son and then to future generations. So um, Courtney Warner was created first Baronet Warner of Brettenham Park, Suffolk in 1910. Brettenham Park by then, as I will mention later on, um, became the centre of um, Courtney Warner's family life, his grand mansion. Um, in 1910, when he when was created a Baronet, he had an, a London home at 56 Cadogan Square. He was a Freemason. Um, there was actually a Masonic Lodge formed called the Warner Lodge, which met in Chingford and had members from Walthamstow. Um, as the plaque in St. Peter's mentioned, he was High Sheriff of Suffolk, but he was also High Sheriff of Essex, 1891. Um, oh, and Lord Lieutenant of Suffolk. He was made to adjust the peace in Somerset, where he was an MP for a period. And in the First World War, he was Director of National Service, East Region. Um, as the plaque mentioned, he was Lieutenant Colonel in the Oxfordshire and Buckinghamshire Light Infantry. But as far as I know, he didn't see any active service in the army, so I'm not quite sure what his rank in the army represented. Uh, he was the first mayor of the municipal borough of Walthamstow when he got incorporated as a borough in 1929. This is more of a ceremonial post than an executive post. Um, you must have felt by 1929 that he'd reached top of the pile in Walthamstow, so in some respects. Uh, I would recommend, if you want to read up some of the background of the Warner estate and Courtney Warner and Walthamstow in um, the 19th century and 20th century, um, a book by James Diamond, a People's History of Walthamstow, which is a commercial publication and we're available in uh, all good bookshops, as they say. 
Um, that gives you the context uh, for the story, and that was published in 2018. Um, the expansion of uh, the London suburbs, certainly in uh, our sector and other others, other sectors, was um, had a political dimension. Suppose the Liberal Party at one stage were very much in favour of a form of development, form of uh, urbanisation, uh, which would favour the Liberal Party. They formed the National Freehold Land Society in 1849. In 1851, that society bought land in Walthamstow and uh, that became Grosvenor Park Road. Uh, it bought land at Markhouse Common and Church Common in Walthamstow at Whips Cross. Um, and these, this land was, was used to build houses that were uh, as affordable as they could make them, but um, could be sold as small freeholds, which would give the head of the household there uh, a vote in national elections. And uh, the idea was that they would vote for the Liberal Party. But the Conservative Party, led by Lord Derby and Benjamin Disraeli, um, widened the electorate, they changed the rules in 1867. So this, this, um, this scheme of the Liberal parties really uh, no longer had so much advantage. But the British Land Company developed out of it. Um, and that continued to be active until uh, the end of the 19th century and beyond. And uh, its secretary at one time was a resident in Walthamstow. Um, in politics, Courtney Warner supported universal male suffrage, votes for all men, uh, free education, and the taxation of rental income. And these, by the standards of their day, were quite radical policies. Um, so I wonder whether in his building up his new property empire, Courtney Warner didn't also have um, ambitions to help the Liberal Party locally get some more votes, provide some stable housing for working class people with just enough money to qualify for a vote. Uh, what I can't find is an awful lot of, uh, well, any instances really, where Courtney Warner actually made an impact on politics. But there we are. The system of expanding London suburbs was driven by the expansion of the railway system. Um, this is a draw, drawing from memory of Lee Bridge Station. That was the first railway line through our part of London in 1840 up the Lee Valley, heading up towards Cambridge. Um, and that's an early version of Lee Bridge Station, which was rebuilt just a few years ago on that site. In a book which I'll mention later by Philip Plummer and Walter Boyer, um, they, they, they think that um, Courtney Warner's and Edward Warner's, uh, Courtney Warner and Edward Warner's um, support for St Peter's Church was related in some way with these plans for um, expanding the London suburbs out in, in the road direction. So, a book I recommend for the story of. Uh, the railways built through Walthamstow and, and uh, adjacent places is by Dr Chris Pond, who's um, Chair of Loughton District Historical Society and President of Walthamstow Historical Society, which published his book, The Walthamstow and Chinkwood Railway, which I thoroughly recommend. Warner Estates had uh, a reputation for aiming at a better than average rent paying tenant. Um, that's what they uh, thought they were doing. Um, they could be a bit choosy about who became a tenant of Warner. Um, the Great Eastern Railway built its branch line through Walthamstow uh, in the early 1870s. And the uh, line was built out to Chingford. Would have gone through Epping Forest, but in fact stopped. Um, the population of Walthamstow had already more than doubled in the previous 20 years. Train service through St James Street Station began 1870. And from 1873, you have a service across Walthamstow Marsh on that uh, brick built viaduct um, from a new Liverpool Street Station um, out towards Chingford. Uh, later in the 1890s, 
Courtney Warner was the main backer in the Walthamstow area for the Tottenham and Forest Gate Railway. That's now become the overground line between Barking and Gospel Oak, with a station at Black Horse Road, not the Victoria Line, but um, the overground station. Um, and that Black Horse Road station is not too far from Horwarden Road, Cornwallis Road, Warner Road, and where Edward Road and so on. So it was, that improved the public transport accessibility of part of the Warner estate. Though in fact, a big impetus for that railway line was freight connecting the Midland Railway with Tilbury and other docks. So here is that book which I mentioned earlier by Philip Plummer, former local manager of Warner Estate, and the late Walter Boyer of Walthamstow Historical Society. And that's, um, that's like a little Bible to the Warner Estate and another book I would recommend. Um, that contains a, a Warner Estate advertisement in 1909, advertising for tenants. And that's boasting about how near their houses were to, uh, flats were, to railway stations. But it doesn't mention trams, it just mentions railways. And in 1905 and 1906, Walthamstow Council, Leighton Council had electrified the tram lines. Um, and particularly for the Leighton part of, of the Warner Estate, that must have been a big, big in, uh, improvement in their public transport uh, service. But it wasn't mentioned by Warner in their advertising. We wonder why. I think that, in fact, the Warner Estate uh, was not really such a commuter land as the Victoria Line brought to Walthamstow. So here you have um, a very good practice of putting a blue plaque, a historical blue, blue plaque to some figure who's found in the censuses or other family history documents to have lived in a property. This is a plaque to a Joshua Harmer and uh, in a Warner property. And he's a foreman in the boot trade, which could have been in central London, but it's not really a commuting job. Um, he could have been a, a local shoe shop foreman. Walthamstow and Leighton got their own industrial areas beside the Lee Valley. So Walthamstow and Leighton came to have local jobs, so people didn't need to commute anyway. Um, so I get the impression that Warners was, was not major commuter land. In, in some ways, the very heart of the Warner estate, its um, sort of root stem, was this um, simple but elegant mansion, um, which is Clock House, and it's on Mission Grove, and it's built in 1813 of very pale bricks made in Suffolk. Um, 1813, Walthamstow, as well as Leighton and Woodford, were a popular location for wealthy city business people to have a second home. Um, they were apart from the capital that time, um, but near enough for um, the, uh, the head of the household to go back and forth by horse or horse-drawn carriage between his business in central London and um, the house, and for him to bring his wife and his, his children if between them if he chose to do. So clock house is on land that the Warner family owned and they began to build on land near clock house um, residential properties for rent, renting out such as Lucha Road uh, which is near St James Street station and um, from about the 1980s I think has been a a building conservation area uh, under the protection of Waltham Forest Council within national legislation. And there you see um, the typical Warner property identified by a pier of front doors spanned by a single arch with a keystone um, and some of the properties having a gabled roof to break up the, the otherwise rather a monotonous line of a long terrace of properties. Um, sometimes they're called half houses. Each uh, door leads to either a downstairs flat or an upstairs flat. Um, some early Warner properties, I think, had um, 
one door which led to two doors, um, but the standard arrangement that we're most familiar with has these two front doors facing onto the street. Um, and you could, I suppose, if you looked at it very carefully, think it was just one house with one front door and somebody living both upstairs and downstairs. Though I think you have to be rather careless in your glances before you thought that. Um, Waltham Forest Oral History Workshop um, have uh, an excellent publication about the life of a Labour councillor called Jenny Hammond. Well, that's got some wonderful background about Jenny Hammond's early married life, um, not in a Warner property, but in a Leighton house where um, the downstairs was rented out to one family and the upstairs was rented out to another and they had to share a lot of facilities. And those really were half houses. Um, Jenny Hammond and, and a friend of hers in the other part of her house um, decided that one afternoon that they would swap. Um, and they managed to change everything around in the afternoon before their husbands returned home to a fait accompli. So that shows you how little belongings these people had and um, um, some um, gender equality in the 1920s. Uh, Warner in the very early stages did, did do some uh, um, community facilities that was again rather capitalist um, driven and what Warner did was they built in the St James Street uh, station area some shop premises to um, a very well you know a pretty fancy design so here's um, a line of shops which have been refurbished in recent years. Um, the dragons um, had gone missing a lot of them, so replacements had to be made. Um, and uh, there's various decoration on the frontages of those shops. And, and that uh, you can get more information from the website of Walth Waltham Forest Oral History Workshop about their projects in St James Street and the history of shopping. Uh, around the station. So here you see amongst those shops up towards the roof line a W for Warner Estate. So this is an example of them kind of building up in a very modern way a brand and a logo. Uh, there's an extract because the exhibition, an exhibition that the Oral History Workshop put up um, can now be seen on the Oral History Workshop uh, website. And it's a very handsomely designed exhibition with um, some great information drawing on oral history, as you'd expect from uh, the workshop's expertise in that area, but also some good historic illustrations and a bit of history. Warner Estate commissioned um, some paint manufacturers up in the northwest of England, I think, to come up with a particular shade of green. I'm afraid I don't myself know the exact shade of green it was. You can see that these doors, um, people have uh, tried to come up with a shade of green, um, but I can't tell you whether any of those were the, like, uh, like the original Warner shade. But originally all the woodwork had to be painted by Warner Estate themselves in that one shade of green and their tenants were not, not to uh, change that. Uh, the, Tenancy agreements can be quite fierce on what the big tenants could and could not do once they stayed in the properties. And that was partly to, to have that conformity of, of appearance, um, which Warner must have felt boosted the rental value of their properties. Uh, another thing that Warner did very occasionally was build premises for an off license. And here's one on Warner Road, um, which has been fantastically uh, refurbished. Um, I think it's rented out as, as residential, but it's a, a great uh, asset to the streetscape now. And you can see some of the decoration in the brickwork um, on the first floor and on that gable end, uh, which mark out Warner Estate as, as um, 
developers who cared more than, than others might. Warren Estate became very, very well known. So uh, Catherine Green and Lucy Harrison uh, did a project on Warren Estate. And out of that project came an exhibition, um, but you can still get a publication, a book, uh, WE, the ex Warner Estate in Waltham Forest. Uh, you can get that from Lucy Harrison's Rendezvous Projects. Um, I shall repeat these links later on, um, but I recommend that publication because that's got a, a great amount of oral history from mainly uh, former residents of Warner Estate, um, but also employees um, and others connected with it. And that builds up a, a fantastic picture of life in Warner Estate properties, um, a pretty remarkable one. And it's full of photos, some from a historic collection of photos commissioned by Warner Estate from um, top national top photographers, Bedford Lemire, and also um, some much more recent photographs by Catherine Green um, and some photos that, that were lent to the project by people um, still living in Warner Estate properties. There was um, a former Water, Warner Estate maintenance office on Rushbrook Crescent. And um, that's uh, it's, it's what it used to be, again, converted to residential. Um, and you can see uh, a good gable end of a Warner Terrace there. Another outcome of Catherine Green's and Lucy Harrison's project, which you can still get the benefit of, is a smartphone app, Android phones, Apple phones, uh, the Warner Estate smartphone app, WA. Um, and that's got guided walks, which you can listen to um, as you walk around or read up before you go, um, as you walk around with your phone in your hand. And again, there's a lot of oral history, a lot of background, photographs. Um, again, I thoroughly recommend it. The original uh, layout of Warner property envisaged a lifestyle powered by coal or coke boilers and cooking ranges. Um, oral history in a source I've mentioned and elsewhere talks about weekly routines where there were a metal bath that would normally be hung up on a hook was taken down, filled with hot water from a boiler, a coal-fired boiler, uh, filled with hot water. Um, and there was also a routine of doing uh, clothes washing on Mondays um, and uh, a roast dinner that had been cooked on the cooking range would be eaten cold on Monday so that the poor woman of the household didn't have to cook a meal as well as do the washing on Mondays, washing them being a very laborious, very muscle intense process. Um, Warner Properties tended only to have bathrooms from 1954, and even then the tenant had to agree to a pay to a hut for a higher rent before they got a bathroom installed. One of the uh, less pleasant aspects of Warner Properties, Warner Flats, has been uh, uh, um, poor soundproofing by modern standards. And um, the WE book has some great memories of this feature, and um, some of them uh, by Catherine Green herself. And also um, there's one garden behind the pair of flats, um, but usually this was divided up by the tenants between them in some fan manner, so that each had some kind of responsibility for maintaining a garden. I've given details for Walthamstow Historical Society. Um, I think I noticed the membership secretary, uh, Jackie Baker, amongst those people attending this talk tonight. Um, but there's the contact details for Walthamstow Historical Society, which, as you can tell, um, has had a long history of being associated with Warner Estate. It's the oldest historical society in Essex. Um, 
It's been a tremendous active force for local history in the area. Um, Leighton uh, performance abysmal in comparison. Uh, Chingford was rather late on the scene, having a historical society. Um, though it does keep going, it has kept going since the 1930s. Um, Leighton Historical is now back running, um, but only since 2005. But Walthamstow Historical, um, a great institution, and uh, Philip Plummer has done a lot of volunteer work in Vestry House Museum, uh, which users of its local studies room still benefit from. Um, I feel that Walthamstow Historic Society could perhaps do with a few extra members. Um, and also some interest in its activities. So I strongly encourage you to take an interest in Walthamstow Historic Society, if, particularly if you live in its area. Right, I'm now going to mention um, uh, different areas of the Warner Estate. Um, so here are roads which I think of as being the Black Horse Road streets, uh, each side of Black Horse Road. You'll see some street names I've just rather randomly picked out. Maud Road, Lucha Road, Courtney Road, which are drawn from the Warner family. Brettonham Road, I've mentioned as their Brettonham Hall they bought in Suffolk and tried to turn into a great family um, mansion and, and uh, baronial base for, for the Warners. They didn't quite become that. And so there's some streets off Winds Avenue, which are Warner Estate developments in both directions, and they are near Lloyd Park. After having done those streets, uh, Warner Estate then turned um, south to um, land that they had an interest in on either side of Leebridge Road, which is E10 which is in Leighton rather than Walthamstow, most of it, their land on Leebridge Road, that's basically in the floodplain or next to the floodplain of the River Lee, um, where Black Horse Road goes along the higher ground towards Leebridge Road, um, that might be fine, but the streets off it slope down to the floodplain of the Lee and along the bottom of that higher ground, runs a historic drainage channel, the Dagenham Brook. And these are photographs of the Dagenham Brook. The left-hand one is at Low Hall. The right-hand one is down by Marsh Lane and Leighton, um, showing it, uh, providing a bit of greenery even now, but would have been important as a way of getting water to escape. There was a big flood in 1947, uh, where Lee Bridge Road was submerged, and I would have thought that, that flooded some of these Warner Estate properties running off Leebridge Road, but I haven't actually heard that it did so. So here's some street names from the area, Blythe Road, Harris Street, Thaden Street, Hibbert Road, Weatherden Street. And those names are drawn from a combination of names in the Warner family um, and family connections, Harris and Blythe, and Hibbert. Um, the portrait is of uh, a member of the Hibbert family who was very wealthy and um, was um, a promoter of West India docks and its links to the slave driven sugar trade. Um, and on the right hand side, you can see um, that Weatherden Hall. Um, is a place out in Suffolk near Brettingham Hall. So here's some more names on the north side of Leebridge Road. Hitcham Road, um, which runs off Leebridge Road, and there's a village near Brettingham Hall, uh, and that's a photograph of its parish church, well, the Grant Parish Church, and of Hitcham Hall, uh, a rather low-lying Lord of the Manor's Hall for Hitcham Village. And on the south side of Lee Bridge Road, uh, here's some more street names uh, connected with the Warner uh, lands in Suffolk, Thorpe Moriel, Thorpe Moreau, 
as it might possibly be pronounced in Suffolk dialect. Kettlebaston, you can see a village sign for Kettlebaston, village sign for Thorpe Murray. Um, Clementina is a name, it's uh, Courtney Warner's wife's name, in, and Bloxall, which is um, again a place, small place, uh, near Breton and Paul. And there's a map, um, you can see Breton just the left of centre, Hitcham just below centre, um, among two other places there I've marked them out with uh, blue, Weatherden up towards top right, Kettlebaston down, down lower, and there's Breton Hall up towards the top of that one. It's now a school, uh, well but it's a village of Breton, which I've marked. Breton Hall is now Old Buckingham Hall, a fee-paying, fee-charging preparatory school, um, so for younger children. Um, and that's shown as Old Buckingham Hall, which is the name they, the school transferred to the Grand Mansion when the school took it over after the Warner family moved out. And Blocks Hall, um, you can see in the centre there. So after developing um, their land either side of Lee Bridge Road, um, sort of 1905, 1910 sort of time, um, then the Warner Estate start to expand um, a bit, bit further north in Walthamstow. It's sometimes called the town planning estate because uh, some of the designs, the streets and, and streetscapes are influenced by the um, Garden City movement, Letchworth, well in Garden City and so on. Um, Keith would be a name in the Warner family. Um, Thorpe Crescent is Thorpe Moria reference to it. Uh, Aldi, I think, is a place in East Anglia which the Walter family is supposed to have had uh, a connection. So after developing streets in the northern part of Walthamstow, but still south of North Secular, south of Billet Lane, Courtney Warner um, turns his attention to a Warner mansion at Woodford Green. Uh, the Warner family owned Himes House from 1848 when Edward Warner bought it. Himes House was the manor house of Hyam Benstead after um, it was moved there in the 18th century as a manor house. Previously, the manor house, that manor, had been at Hyam Hill where Billet Road as a, a right hand bend. Um, so um, Courtney Warner looks at the land that his family owns around Hyam's house and he starts building properties. Uh, these photos are on Chingford Lane, running off um, the high road through Woodford Green. So you can see these properties are very much in the Walthamstow type of Warner housing. Pairs of flats, an upstairs and a downstairs, their own front doors spanned by one keystoned arch and the odd gable to break up the terrace. Um, those properties were being uh, built at the very end of the 19th century. And then after the First World War, then um, Courtney Warner um, draws out plans for a whole estate of houses um, between the Woodford Green High Road and Himes Park, Park as it now is. Um, and the development starts um, along Montauk Road, along the crest of the road, really. So um, these uh, have been modified since Courtney Warner laid them out, um, but um, they are more imposing facades. Uh, they are meant to look like uh, the homes of relatively wealthy people uh, with fine views across Himes Park Lake. And then, um, in the 1920s, 1930s, 1920s, later 1920s mainly, I think, um, the Warner family, which I suspect is being driven not by an aging Courtney Warner, but by his son, um, 
So those streets are Woodton Road, Douglas Avenue, Penryn. No, sorry, no, those are, no, sorry, those are the town planning estate. No, the ones in Woodford Green are 1930s, Creelock Grove, Henry's Avenue, Mason Road. Um, I need to go back. Previous, yes, there. Uh, um, Tamsworth Avenue, Canesham Avenue. Um, and th at this period, the Warners are now doing what everybody else was doing, which is selling off the houses they built. And they were charging in 1934, prices between £1,000 and £3,000. Um, well, I've read that in some places you could get a semi detached house in the 1930s for £500. So Warner were definitely aiming at a higher segment of the market than um, the very best of value housing, in, newly built housing in the 1930s. Um, design not looking particularly to my mind uh, super special, but they are quite wide front, well, they're very wide frontages to the sides of houses. So they're meant to look quite imposing for the size of house. So they probably had extensive gardens behind as well. And also in the 1930s, which is my next slide, the Warner family start developing um, commercial property. And this is Brettenham House, named after Brettenham Hall in Suffolk. Um, and again, it's meant to be a rather um, upmarket commercial development. The situation is overlooking the River Thames from the northern end of Waterloo Bridge. Um, a sister of mine worked in there for a time and you went inside and there were sort of um, um, fake marble surfaces um, and, and wide stairways um, and various sorts of features, um, brass handrails and so on, um, to try and get a, uh, a higher class and therefore um, higher rent of commercial tenant. Right, and now I've got to come to what I'm thinking of as the demise of Warner Estate. Um, so Courtney Warner dies in, at 34 Grosvenor Gardens, where he started life. Um, so back in the centre of London, perhaps for medical treatment. Um, and he's buried in the churchyard of Thorpe Moria in Suffolk. There's a memorial window to him in Breton Parish Church. And the estate he left behind was £288,000, roughly. And as there was Edward Courtney Thomas Warner. And I'm afraid I don't know anything about Edward Warner um, or about the way he administered the Warner estate properties in uh, the later 1930s, 1940s, uh, 1950s. Um, and indeed, there's a big gap in, in the knowledge I've been able to acquire as to how what life was like on the Walthamstow and later Warner estate in the 1930s and 1940s. We know something about bomb damage, which is certainly incurred. Um, but uh, beyond that, I really um, am not able to supply a lot of information. Um, as I've tried to explain, um, property development in the 1930s was very much uh, an era of um, building on land, building new houses, mainly semi-detached, and selling them off straight away. You, you don't bother trying to maintain an estate. It's just um, an inn build, sell, uh, as property development tends to be. Um, so the renting out in Walthamstow and Leighton must have looked pretty old fashioned in the 1930s and 1940s. And I think probably was the tenants were looking less enterprising people for um, people, their income, perhaps less people on, uh, running their own businesses, their own artisan business is less like that, less blue collar, um, I suspect. Um, so in the W. Warner State book, um, there are some references to 
uh, memories of the way Warner Estate was run. Um, sounds like a deeply conservative enterprise by the 1950s and 1960s. Um, seems to have relied on word of mouth to replace tenants um, when they moved out or when they died. Um, very, relied very much on personal interview. Um, and I'm not quite clear, but I, I, I wouldn't have thought if you were really a ruthless rental landlord, you'd have done it that way. I would have thought you would have been trying to maximise your rent from the properties and deal with any uh, misbehaviour as best you could um, as it resulted. But that wasn't the Warner method. They were, they were trying to be very much long term, um, proper, responsible landlords, I believe. And, and, and their reputation um, seems to have been high, even though they weren't very um, pressing in getting all their properties modernized with modern bathrooms, modern kitchens, which by the 1970s, 1980s, they, they, to most people, they were in desperate need of. The Warner family gave up Bretton Hall in the 1950s. Um, I would think that's probably the outcome of policies of Lloyd George liberals before the First World War and Clement Attlee socialists after the Second World War with death duties. I should imagine it meant that uh, the Warner family were no longer able to maintain a, a big um, rural grandee lifestyle um, from their income from uh, the Warner properties and other sources. Um, the fourth baronet uh, Warner is Sir Philip Courtney Thomas Warner, uh, born in 1951. Um, he has a male heir, so the Warner family should be able to continue. Uh, Sir Philip was, himself was, was educated at Eton College, so that tradition main, is maintained. So there's continuity there. Um, so um, we're left now with a Warner estate where a whole gener a new generation of people has moved in. Um, that uh, I think uh, very few of them, if any of them, are rented out. No, they're uh, owner occupied. Uh, a lot of the owners are very keen, um, very proud of their properties, very keen to maintain them well and to look at the history of what they were like when they were originally built and rented out. Um, so there's an awful lot of interest uh, currently in and in previous decades in the Warner estate. Um, so I'm going to finish now. So that's what I'm able to tell you, but I'm very happy to answer questions as best I'm able. Yes, absolutely. I was um, planning on putting a few to you, David. Um, but first, I'd just like to say thank you so much for such an interesting talk. Applause would be ringing out if everyone wasn't on mute. <laughs> um, I, I found it particularly interesting looking at some of the road names that I hadn't heard of, um, and also looking at some of the different styles of houses that the one has built. Bressingham House at Waterloo, I had no idea that sort of variety in in what they were up to so that was fun um, and it was really nice as well to see on the chat lots of people sharing their own sort of comments or memories of warner properties so things like outside toilets and coal bunkers growing up um, and of course lots of interest in the green and cream front doors so thank you all so much for your comments as well um, i do have a few questions that i've been gathering over the course of your talk david um, so one from another David asks um, if you could give more detail about the estate um, being part of the Liberal Party attempt at local gerrymandering. I mean, this this is linking of uh, the development of the Walthamstow and perhaps uh, Warner estate uh, with Liberal Party politics is is um, a pretty well an invention of mine. As I was reading up the subject, I was thinking, hold on a moment, there must be a connection here. Um, so I don't see it referred to elsewhere. Um, I think Walthamstow Historic Society might possibly have a problem in that um, its president uh, up until fairly recently was um, the top man in the Warner family. So although 
Waltham says historical has benefited from its links with the Warner family. Um, I imagine they don't feel they can be too rude about it. Um, and I wonder myself whether I should attempt some uh, uh, disparaging comments, but I, I mean, it wouldn't be from knowledge. It would, I, I just wonder. Um, so I can't say a bit more. Um, and James Darman's book about people's history of Walthamstow is um, the best background I can give. And there, Walthamstow had been considered a Conservative Party stronghold, amazingly. But um, James, in his book, uh, gives some excellent information about uh, sort of uh, radical politics coming from the left to the left of the Liberal Party, as we would see it: socialism. Um, um, populist politicians with radical agendas, um, uh, stirring things up, uh, which I imagine would have been uh, not liked by Courtney Warner. Um, but I, ca I can't find, um, you know, I just haven't read any of speeches in the House of Commons where he lays things out. Um, the records seem to be more of um, fates being opened by Lady Warner. So um, uh, I'm short of information on that. <laughs> I've got two questions that Penny's submitted on the chat. So she's asked, um, was it unusual to have purpose-built flats in the north? Um, and also were the Warner family viewed as philanthropists, do you know? Um, and the Warner family were, uh, certainly did some uh, philanthropy. Um, so I th they, they supported a community hall south of Lee Bridge Road. That was one of the things they did. We, we know they think of it uh, as philanthropy. There was the support of the Church of England. But um, I don't get, get the impression it was a major part of their life. Um, uh, as I was reading it, I was struggling to really get to the heart of what, what made them Courtney Warner and um, subsequent heads of the family tick. You know, what was driving them? Um, and uh, they didn't become major political figures or ever back at back or perhaps more likely backroom um, pullers of strings. I, uh, there's no reference to that. Um, it's, it's all a bit curious to my mind. You know, they seem to have laid all the foundations for really great things and, and they don't happen. So I tried to very briefly mention um, that uh, certainly in later near the Stratford Railway Works, um, properties were being uh, houses which were built as one house for a household were split up with one family occupying the upstairs, one the downstairs, without major construction work to facilitate that. And they were called half houses. Um, I don't quite know when the half house concept was developed. I don't think it was uh, a, a world first for Walthamstow. Um, I think it must have occurred elsewhere, but um, uh, the Warner estate seemed to be um, taking something which occurred elsewhere and doing it better in that they were properly subdivided and properly regulated by long-term landlords. Um, Jenny Hammond, as I say in that oral history work, which you can find on the website of Waltham Forest Oral History Workshop, gives a little background of, of um, the half house in Leighton that she shared, which was an ad hoc thing. I've also tried to investigate something called the Abraham Estate, which is in Leighton, Richmond Road, um, Newport Road, streets like that, where they're much longer less um, variegated terraces of houses, but they were retained by the Abraham estate right into the 1960s, um, with maintained by the Abraham estate. Um, and they tended to have uh, an upstairs and a downstairs with different separate front doors, but they're sort of, the front doors are really tightly packed together and you don't have that rather elegant single keystone arch above them. So they are doing what Warner is doing, slightly further north, but in a slightly less extravagant way, slightly less ambitious way. Um, sticking with the um, architectural side of things, David, a couple of questions um, from Callum and Josephine about the two-door layout of the property. 
don't know if there was sort of one particular architect um, tasked with coming up with that design and sort of replicating it across the borough. And then the, the sort of second element was, uh, is the sort of double door design of the houses linked to any of the arts and crafts, um, obviously most famously espoused by William Morris. Um, yes, uh, I've seen no record of any uh, uh, definite influence of William Morris on Warner Estate. And indeed, um, biographers of William Morris uh, include uh, Morris comments about Walthamstow having become terribly cocknified. He didn't seem impressed with it. He, um, I mean, Warner were not the only property builders in Walthamstow, um, but uh, there's no record of Morris distinguishing Warners from the other um, property developers in Walthamstow. Um, and um, uh, yes, I, th I think um, it's thought that um, Warners were influenced by, uh, my memory is failing me, the architect of uh, the original Scotland Yard. Um, and the Warner family had their own architect who they used, whose name again isn't on my tissue, on my lips, but um, they employed him to design some property and then just carried on using those designs, basically. They didn't bring him back to design street after street. Uh, they just uh, paid him to design some properties and then continued with that scheme over the rest of their properties. Fantastic. Um, I think I'll just ask one last question, David, um, and then we'll let everyone um, get on with whatever other plans they have for their evening. Um, so the last sort of theme of the question is about um, the rents and access to the estates. Uh, so do you know if the rents compared uh, favourably to other houses or council properties um, in the 1900s? Easy to get a place at a Warner in a Warner house or flat, or did you have to sort of know the right people? I don't, I don't have any good comparative information about rent levels. Um, as I tried to say, um, the, um, uh, what Warner said they were doing and what their local reputation was for, was for being choosy about their tenants um, and perhaps charging a bit more rent, but not a lot more rent than uh, the hoi polloi, as one oral history uh, contributor describes it um, and but it is striking how the, the oral history collected in the W.E. Warner Estate book is uh, talks about a number of people who only managed to rent uh, a Warner Estate flat because they knew somebody or they knew somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody extraordinarily um, and it was this word of mouth Whereas um, in the early days of that development, it was big newspaper advertisements London-wide. So um, there's a change there. As I say, it seems to me an uncommercial change. Um, but again, I, uh, I struggle sometimes to really get to the basic motivation of the Warner family. I'm going to end the meeting there. So once again, thank you so much for your time, David, and what's been a really interesting talk um and having the opportunity to have questions answered as well it's been fantastic so thank you so much for that i'll send around a few st peter's links with information about other activities and events that we've got coming up in the near future um so further history talks um other things to do with local heritage but also um hopefully lots of good reasons to come and visit our church as well and find out what we're doing directly